We have Judy Greenwald. Uh, Judy, are you with us virtually? I am, yes, thank you. Okay. And can um, Patrick Wade enable screen sharing while I introduce him? Uh, please, Judy, just introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your, with your uh, testimony. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Judy Greenwald. I'm the Executive Director of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. I'm going to be tag teaming this presentation with Patrick White, who's a project, management, a project manager at NIA. And we are both really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. So uh, let's get Ms. Greenwald, can I just ask, uh, what, what is the Nuclear uh, Innovation Alliance, just uh, in a sentence uh, or two? What do you I'm do? I'm going to explain on the next page. So NIA is a think and do tank, a public interest group working to ensure the conditions for success for advanced nuclear energy to be a key part of the climate solution. Advanced nuclear energy can ensure and accelerate progress towards achieving deep decarbonization goals. Does that give you enough? You want a little more about us? No, that, that, that's fine. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, next slide. So why do we need advanced nuclear energy for a deep decarbonization? There are actually several reasons. First, we need to pursue a portfolio of promising technology options to provide the best chance of success. We have to think about solving the climate just like investors think about a successful investment portfolio. Also, the electricity system in many ways is like a giant machine, and it has to have a lot of components working together. And it needs a lot of energy sources, different types of energy sources, so that as a system, it can all work together to be reliable, affordable, and zero carbon and meet all of society's goals. In particular, the electricity system needs clean, firm resources like advanced nuclear energy to balance variable resources. Advanced nuclear energy can be available whenever it is called upon 24-7. Deep decarbonization studies, and there's a whole literature on this, show that firm energy sources like nuclear energy make it both much more likely to achieve deep decarbonization and also reduce carbon decarbonization costs. So for the United States as a whole and, and for a state like Minnesota that uses substantial amounts of nuclear electricity now, advanced nuclear energy could really be an important tool to help us continue to make progress towards meeting climate and clean energy goals. Uh, next slide. Many people don't realize that commercial advanced reactor deployment is underway for several technology developers in the United States. You're going to hear later today from Oklo, who is planning to deploy in 2025. Uh, Ultrasafe Nuclear and Kairos Power are planning to deploy in 2026. Uh, Terra Power and X Energy in 2027. And GE Hitachi and New Scale in 2029. And these are just the announced ones. There's also a number of developers who are working towards commercialization this decade as well as a little bit early into the next decade. And what's happening is there's a lot of private investment flowing into this sector, and there's also quite a bit of public investment. The federal government, is, through the Department of Energy, is putting a lot of money into advanced reactor innovation. And it's through federal public-private partnerships that we're getting a lot of progress, and there's a lot of promising progress being made. Uh, Ms. Ms. Greenwald, could, could I interrupt? Uh, just uh, could I just interrupt you? Do you, do you know what the sure. states are that these, uh, in, you know, uh, new, new uh, facilities are, are planned to be in? So yeah, and in fact, I'll um, actually I'll turn to Patrick. Do you have the list with us, or should we provide that for the record, or do you know them offhand? Uh, I know them offhand. If that would be helpful. Uh, so the Terra Power project is their Natrium facility in Wyoming. Uh, the X Energy project is the XC100 that they're looking at building in Washington State. Uh, Ultrasafe Nuclear Corporation has announced uh, plans to build a test reactor on the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign's campus. Oaklow Power is looking at developing and deploying their uh, Aurora powerhouse at the Idaho National Lab site in Idaho. Uh, Kairos Power is developing a test reactor, uh, their Hermes test reactor in Tennessee near Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, G. Hitachi has not formally announced uh, where they will be siting a uh, uh, plan in the United States, but has planned deployments, and they also have an announced project with Ontario Power Generation, OPG, to deploy uh, their BWRX300 technology in Canada. And New Scale has uh, announced plans with uh, UAMP, the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, uh, to deploy uh, their New Scale reactor module technology at the Idaho National Lab. 
So it's kind of a mix of deployment in the Western United States, uh, some in the Eastern United States, and some in Canada out of these announced projects. Uh, thank you very much. That was valuable for us. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. So development and deployment of advanced nuclear energy has climate, domestic, and international benefits. Because of all this innovation that's going on in the United States, there's a real opportunity through advanced nuclear energy to reestablish American global leadership in nuclear technology, which in the past few years we've unfortunately ceded to state-owned enterprises in China and Russia. There's also enormous opportunity for advanced nuclear energy to help us with decarbonizing power and non-electric sectors and to make more safety improvements and to replace retiring power plants. I should also mention that the nuclear industry creates a lot of high paying jobs. So I'm now gonna segue to Patrick White who will be discussing more deeply advanced nuclear energy and regulation and then I'll come back at the end to close. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. White. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick White. I'm a project manager with the Nuclear Innovation Alliance. And so I'm gonna touch a little bit on what is advanced uh, nuclear energy and kind of talk about what potential advantages and benefits of, uh, are of this new type of technology. So when we speak broadly about advanced nuclear energy, we're really talking about a kind of new deployment, new technologies for nuclear energy that can add flexibility and versatility in comparison to the conventional nuclear technologies that we're operating today. And a lot of this comes through innovative choices in how these plants are gonna be designed and operated. We can break down these differences and kind of the increased flexibility and versatility among a number of categories. Uh, the first category is reactor size. Normally when we talk about conventional nuclear power plants in the United States, they tend to be very large facilities. Um, usually larger than 500 megawatts electric, and these are facilities that are going to power hundreds of thousands of homes. When we talk about advanced nuclear energy, it can come in a variety of sizes, whether it's small reactors as small as 1.5 megawatts to some even larger than 300 megawatts. There's a large variety of different uh, use cases that advanced nuclear power plants can be designed to satisfy. When we talk about reactor technology, again, when we talk about conventional nuclear energy, it's predominantly light water reactors or reactors that use kind of traditional uh, water that we use every day to cool the reactor and maintain operations. When we talk about advanced nuclear energy, there might be a variety of different reactor fuels or reactor coolants that might be used to try to generate power. When we talk about generation type, uh, for conventional nuclear energy, it's primarily baseload. It's the idea of a power plant that's gonna operate at 100% power and really serve as kind of the backbone to an electrical system. While that's worked in uh, previous decades for generation, in the future, we're really gonna be interested in more flex flexible uh, generation and more dispatchable generation that can meet more varying uh, energy demands throughout the course of the day, week, month, year, season, and can really complement well uh, variable renewable sources like solar and wind. When we talk about things like safety approach and fuel efficiency, conventional nuclear energy has really relied on active safety systems and low enriched uranium fuel while well, advanced nuclear energy is going to be really designed with inherent safety systems using a variety of different fuels. Now, one thing I'll spend just a moment kind of touching on here is this idea of the safety approach and the difference between active safety and passive or inherent safety. Um, the traditional plants today are operated at a very, very high level of safety. And this is both um, due to their design, their operators, and the regulatory oversight by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But these plants really rely on having backup power and backup systems that can keep the core cool under all conditions after the reactor is shut down. And while this approach is very safe, it requires you to have a lot of operations, a lot of um, design assurance to make sure that you can always maintain these safety systems to perform their function. For advanced nuclear technology, there's a big focus on either passive safety, where you don't have to have active pumps, active valves, active systems, and can instead rely on things like gravity-driven flows to passively remove heat without the need for operator intervention. Some advanced nuclear energy technologies are even designed with inherent safety, where the actual fuel form itself or the reactor technology itself um, will significantly reduce the risks of any types of release of radionuclides. A really good example of this within fuels is the idea of triso fuel. And this is a specific fuel form that's being utilized by several advanced reactor developers, where it's a small amount of uranium fuel that's covered in layers of carbon. And these layers of carbon actually serve as a barrier to prevent the release of radioactive material under almost all conditions. And so the reactor is almost inherently safe because of the way it's containing the fuel products. And so this is kind of one of the major changes when we start thinking about uh, conventional nuclear energy versus advanced nuclear energy. 
Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide, but when we talk about advanced nuclear energy, a lot of times we'll talk about the different advantages of different technologies. Um, there are a lot of different types of advanced reactors, and different advanced reactors will have different specific advantages. For example, um, there's been a lot, of uh, a lot of interest in high temperature gas reactors, or HTGRs. And an example of this reactor technology would be the X energy reactor. Uh, this reactor uses high, uh, high temperature hydrogen, or sorry, helium gas to remove the heat from the fuel. And then that energy can then be used to make electricity, have process heat, or have other uh, applications. It's a very well established technology. It operates at a really high temperature that might be suitable for electric or non-electric applications. Other reactor technologies, for example, like sodium fast reactors, use uh, liquid sodium as a way to actually remove the heat from the nuclear fuel inside of the reactor. This is a very, very efficient way to remove heat and also allows it to partner with energy storage systems. For example, the natrium reactor being developed by TerraPower couples a sodium fast reactor with a molten salt energy storage system. So essentially this molten salt energy storage system can store energy during the day when it's not needed and then use it uh, during periods where there might be additional demand or where it might need to help complement uh, variable, variable renewable energy sources. You can imagine having this energy storage being utilized at night when solar resources might not be available. And so there are a lot of different applications and different use cases for advanced reactor technologies. Now, in addition to just the different types of technologies, there are a lot of different use cases that are also really interesting for advanced technology. Uh, specifically, when we talk about reactor sizes, they can go from these very small micro reactors that might power uh, small rural or off-grid locations to very large reactors. There are also a number of product, products that we might be really interested in whether it's heat, hydrogen, or other uh, fuel forms that can really help kind of look towards a decarbonized society. Um, with this, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about licensing of advanced nuclear technology. Uh, this is something that's of interest to NIA and is really of interest as we think about deployment of this technology. Now, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is responsible for the licensing of all commercial nuclear facilities in the United States. And this is at every stage from design and testing through manufacturing and construction, operation and maintenance, and ultimately to decommissioning disposal. They're really looking at ensuring the safety of all aspects of the life cycle. One of the challenges, however, is when we talk about the existing regulatory frameworks uh, today that the NRC has, they are really optimized for today's operating nuclear reactors. A lot of the rules, a lot of the processes, and a lot of the requirements were designed to ensure the safe operation for things like the Monticello nuclear uh, generating plant and might not be appropriate for the advanced technologies. They've just been so specialized for this very specific type of generation. Uh, the NRC is currently, under, uh, currently undergoing a process called regulatory modernization, where they're looking to make more effective and more efficient rules to help license some of these novel advanced reactors. Uh, the three principles they'll generally talk about are risk-informed, performance-based, and technology-inclusive regulation. This idea is really trying to come up with rules for advanced reactors that ensure that the regulatory requirements are actually really assessing what can go wrong with a, uh, an advanced nuclear facility. What's the probability? What's the consequence? How do we design for it? Performance-based, making sure that we focus on the outcomes that we're interested in and not just on prescribing rules. And then technology-inclusive, making sure it can really be applicable to any of the advanced reactor technologies that we're currently talking about. Um, advanced reactor developers are making a lot of progress in licensing, with some developers actually starting um, pre-application and application activities for, for specific sites, uh, facilities, and designs. Um, I think pretty much all the facilities I've already discussed earlier when you were asking about the siting locations are listed here, and the developers are at different stages of working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to review and have their designs approved. And so it's a really exciting time, and we're seeing a lot of progress in the licensing and then hopefully the ultimate deployment of these advanced reactor technologies. And with that, I will turn it back over to Judy Greenwald. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. White. Uh, Ms. Greenwald, do yeah. you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm just going to say a little bit about the state of play on advanced nuclear energy state action. So we can go to the next slide. So on this map, you can see in yellow the states that before 2015 enacted some, port, some form of advanced reactor inclusive legislation. And then the states in green enacted that type of legislation between 2015 and 2022. And the states in blue are states who just this year, just in the first few months of 2022, are either considering or have enacted advanced reactor inclusive legislation. The types of legislation states are considering are similar to what you all are considering today. 
having studies of advanced nuclear energy, removing restrictions on new nuclear construction. And a number of states are incorporating advanced reactors into their broader state and climate, state climate and clean energy policies. So it's a very exciting time to be involved in state action on advanced nuclear energy. So going to the last slide with the takeaways. So nuclear energy is an important tool for climate change mitigation. Advanced nuclear energy can help play a unique role. And development of advanced nuclear energy is already underway in the U.S., more than most people realize. The NRC regulatory modernization and federal investment in technology innovation are enabling advanced reactor development and state legislative policy changes can catalyze technology deployment. And we'll go to the final slide just to let you know that we're really happy to be a resource for this committee today, happy to answer questions, and also happy to be a resource for you going forward as you consider these really important issues. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate your presentations. Uh, we'll just, if you could hang, hang with us for some questions, and we have some. Uh, I would just uh, ask this, and I'm not sure if you're in a position to talk about capital costs of, uh, of uh, advanced nuclear reactors or not, uh, uh, for instance, on a per megawatt basis or whatever, whatever measurement we, we measure capital costs on, on new installations. Uh, how, how would they compare to other clean energy applications? Does anyone know? Patrick, do you want to take that? Sure. So I think um, I will first off say that's a very interesting question, um, a very complicated question, because a lot of it relates to thinking about the deployment of these technologies, not just the first of a kind, but what's it like when we're developing the second, third, and fourth bit. It's also a question of kind of thinking about the larger ecosystem of energy systems. Um, one of the advantages of constructing one of these advanced nuclear facilities is that it will give us this idea of kind of firm, dispatchable, low-carbon power. Um, as opposed to if we were thinking about renewables, it's thinking about how we can partner those with things like energy storage. So thinking about kind of the overall cost of an energy system, it's also thinking about the specific role. While, um, rene while renewable sources may be very, very effective at providing lots of amounts of electricity, um, essentially meeting those kind of unmet demands are really effective from nuclear. So that was a really a long way of saying um, there's still a lot of ongoing work on costs. Um, I think on a kind of a per kilowatt hour basis, you'll see estimates from $3,000 per kilowatt up to uh, $7,000 or $8,000 per kilowatt, but that's very much a developer specific question. So they'll be able to provide kind of the best insights on the exact costs and what they're predicting for their technology. Good. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, questions of the witnesses, uh, Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for bringing this uh, kind of discussion forward. We should be talking about this to the extent decarbonization is our goal, nuclear is carbon-free, but we have some questions regarding the waste storage and some of the safety, so I was hoping I could uh, ask some questions of Mr. White, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, please. All right. Uh, Mr. White, first of all, uh, the advanced nuclear technology, can you say a little more about the generation of nuclear waste as compared to conventional um, I don't know enough to know whether there is a difference, and if so, would you mind sharing with the committee what is the difference? Mr. White? No, a, thank you very much, Senator, for the question. Um, I think ultimately these advanced nuclear reactors are also going to produce some spent nuclear fuel, as they call it. Um, the big question really ends up becoming what is the specific fuel form, and then how does it enter into a larger conversation about the long-term handling of these wastes? Um, there are some advanced reactor designs that look to utilize uh, spent fuel from other facilities or more effectively utilize the uh, fuel. Uh, one example is if you talk about uh, something called high burn-up fuels, it's the idea of more effectively utilizing the uranium that's already in the fuel. And so you're essentially getting more energy out of the same volume. And so there's a hope that over kind of a long-term operation, you'd be able to generate more energy with less waste. Um, a lot of this will be kind of a very technology-specific question and how it works into a larger national strategy on managing spent nuclear fuel. But I think that's kind of a, a broad answer. I'm happy to get into more specifics if there are other questions you have on that. Senator Fritz, any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do. Um, well, I'm not smart enough to know the uh, follow-up that to be asked, but I think what I heard you say is there is some hope with some of the advanced nuclear technologies that will be able to produce uh, the same amount of energy on, a little, on less waste. Is that a fair summary? Yes, I mean, a lot of it will get, uh, so, my apologies, Senator. Um, yes, I believe that a lot of it will come into the specific design and utilization. 
And it's a balancing act, I think, for these developers in terms of how would they like to operate their facilities, what makes sense in terms of the fuel cycle, and then what are kind of the social and societal constraints they want to work with. Um, but it would be possible for some of the advanced reactor designs. Again, the developers will have the best insights on kind of what their current state of the art and current thinking is on these. Senator Fritz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. White. So given that we are hoping for improvements in the generation of nuclear waste, um, fair to say that we still have questions about how we're going to dispose of the nuclear waste. Is there any uh, suggestion by your organization that there is a better way to store nuclear waste or a safer way than the way we're doing it now? And I'm thinking of Prairie Island, um, the closest community in the nation to store nuclear waste. Uh, Mr. White. Great. Thank you, Senator. Well, um, I will defer to the Executive Director, Judy Greenwald, for any official NIA positions. I'd hate to speak out of turn on that. <laughs> Um, I will say there are very interesting um, proposals for how we could think about dealing with uh, spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste. Um, a lot of the times it's discussions on how can we try to remove from communities where either the facility is no longer operating or whether it might not make sense for that community. And so there are options and discussions around uh, things like interim storage, the idea of consolidating spent nuclear fuel in a single location um, away from the site where it was produced. Um, there are also uh, extended discussions thinking about long-term geologic disposal. Um, while the Yucca Mountain Project, the traditional project in the United States for deep geologic uh, disposal has been a very um, controversial and complex technical and political issue, um, there are a lot of other different approaches that are being looked at. Uh, the one thing I will touch at kind of that goes across both the interim storage and the kind of long-term storage is this idea of using consent-based processes. And this is something that's been demonstrated uh, very effectively in several European countries. The idea of working with communities so that they have an understanding of where these facilities are being built, what the potential benefits to the community are for operation, and what the potential burden on the community would be. And so I think really underpinning any uh, advanced nuclear uh, fuel cycle and waste, that, waste strategy that we're interested in, it's making sure that we consider that the communities have a voice in what's going on with these processes. But I think there are steps forward and that we're starting to see some action at the federal level with the Department of Energy looking into how to implement some of these processes. Uh, Senator Fritz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's all for now. Uh, Mr. White, may I just follow up? Uh, uh, as far as you're aware, is uh, Yucca Mountain, some, some of us in this room have been to Yucca Mountain. Is, is that off limits uh, uh, for any future consideration as far as you're aware? I believe I will let uh, Judy Greenwald take a first pass at that. So, you know, that's not Speed really off. a technical question, so that's why uh, Patrick is deferring back to me. You know, it's, it's a political decision by our country about where to put the waste. Um, and I'm, so I, I think the question you're asking me is what would be my political judgment about whether um, it will be back on the table, and I, I don't know that I, I know any better than, okay. than you do. I do think that we need to step back in this country and rethink how we've been thinking about what to do about long-term storage. And as Patrick said, we really do need a consent-based process. We have to basically go back to square one and say, okay, where should this go? Talk to the community, talk to the state, make sure that we're trying to um, put waste where people are comfortable with it remaining uh, permanently. And so I think that's just going to have to be a societal and political process. Uh, we as NIA think that you can store uh, waste permanently and safely, um, but we, we, it's not really a technical matter about where communities and the country wants to put it. We also think that this, the uh, current interim storage that we're doing now, and interim storage is a technical term, but the, the current management that we're doing for nuclear waste is safe. Um, we have a very good record in this country of making sure that the waste is um, isolated and uh, maintained and is safe. And it's just, we do need a long-term solution and we've been struggling as a country to, to figure that out. And as Patrick said, there are other countries who are moving ahead and we have some role models now. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. White. Um, this is a broad question, but are there is there a technology now that is being explored that um, can be used to to further mitigate 
eliminate, reuse, or dispose of the waste. You know, and I saw the example um, in, the, in our last meeting uh, in the Netherlands, for example, and I think France also has a different uh, way of disposing of waste. So do we have anything online that's coming along that will help us, uh, those of us who've hesitated in the past, uh, to, to better understand and feel more secure about disposing waste. Thank you. To either of the witnesses. <laughs> Great, I would love to take a first shot at that question. Um, yeah, so thank you, Senator. I think the process you're referring to is something called, and I, I, I hesitate to get a little technical here, called transmutation. And it's really this process of trying to use different nuclear reactions to try to change the material to make it less hazardous over a long period of time. So what you're commonly describing is certain reactor designs and certain technologies can be used to try to take radioactive waste that might be radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years and change the nuclear structure so it becomes a material that might be radioactive for a shorter period of time. Um, there are some ways to do this that have been proposed. Um, I think specifically the example you're talking to in Europe where you can use um, different particle accelerators or different types of technology to try to reduce the, the, the long-term hazards of the waste. There are also are some reactor designs um, that will try to essentially use the characteristics of the nuclear fuel and the nuclear reactor core to essentially accelerate this transmutation process. Um, one example of this would be something called a liquid molten salt reactor, where you can actually um, dissolve the nuclear fuel inside of a molten salt. So it's a reactor technology that's underdeveloped by some developers. Um, I don't think it was any of the developers that we've spoken about today yet. But that is um, one of the proposed approaches that potentially would have some long-term impacts on waste. Um, I think there, is a, there are a lot of important caveats to that. Um, it can be a challenging technology, and I think there's still a lot of technology development and scientific investigations that would need to be pursued. So um, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a silver bullet when it comes to thinking about that with any kind of technical solutions. But there are a lot of really exciting opportunities to kind of continue the scientific uh, development and technology demonstration and development to try to determine are there ways we could deal with this on a technical basis. Good. Good. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank Senator. you, Mr. Chair. Any follow up? Okay. Anybody else? Uh, if not, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Greenwald, uh, Mr. White, uh, for his fascinating testimony and uh, know that we really do appreciate it. And uh, certainly, if you want to continue on uh, through our hearing, Please feel free. Uh, otherwise, if you have to leave, well, that's uh, understandable. So thank you again so very, very much. Let's move on uh, next to Mr. George Griffin. He's with Small Modular Reactor, reactor Lead at the Idaho National Laboratory. going to talk about uh, fossil to fission. Mr. Griffin, there you are. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Please introduce yourself and, uh, for the record, yeah, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. It's George Griffith. I work for Idaho National Laboratory. Um, it's my third national laboratory. Before that, I was an engineer at a nuclear plant. Before that, uh, working for one of the large reactor vendors. So sort of a broad background uh, across the nuclear industry. INL and the Nuclear Energy Institute were looking to consider what's involved with changing from coal-based power plants to a nuclear power plant on the same site. And when my boss came to me and gave me that assignment, it was largely a thought of, I'm responsible for that. What do I think I need to know to be successful? So sort of an engineering approach. Rapidly turned into a complicated issue that's more than just the engineering. Um, we see a lot of changes going on very rapidly in the coal industry right now. Plants are being shut down. Their values are being written down. They're being sold for very low values. And companies are looking to close plants well before the end of their effective lifetime. And when you look at that, that's a valuable resource that maybe is being at least partially uh, eliminated before its time really should come. And in particular, you've got communities with jobs, um, unique energy producing jobs, or there's you know, a company power plant, um, lots of different jobs. Uh, we'd like to retain those. Um, we see the grid interconnection, the transformer yard, the lines that run in and out of the plant. Those are very valuable. If you were to go to a green field, I think we understand that the um, regulatory aspects, the uh, real estate aspects, the permitting aspects, all make responding to needed changes very slow. So if we're getting rid of grid connections very quickly, we might not be able to replace them as 
quickly as we get rid of them, making the coal plant grid connections very valuable. And then the water and cooling systems that go with a coal plant can be transitioned into a nuclear plant, which in some particular locales is of uh, great importance. Um, so we're seeing opportunities, lots of changes. These new nuclear reactors, as described in the advanced re uh, reactor presentations, offer new opportunities for both industry, efficiency, um, safety that didn't exist even 10 years ago. Um, nuclear and coal look a lot alike. You know, as you drive by them on the highway and look at them, they're both big plants. They both um, have towers usually, cooling systems, complexity. Um, when you get down to the nitty gritty of what's going on inside the plants, you're spinning a turbine with steam generally. Those are only broad, broad similarities. The actual details of what pressure they run at, what temperatures they run at, how the heat is transferred, the materials are built out of, um, the design history of those components can be very, very different. So when I look at it, I'm a little bit pessimistic when somebody talks about you can just change one to the other. You can just go from cold to nuclear. They're not as compatible maybe as it would first seem uh, to be there. And so I think there's technical innovation that would have to occur. Uh, the TerraPower folks are doing that with their heat storage, as was mentioned earlier. So that's a real unique opportunity associated with advanced reactors. Um, and as you study this, this factors, each plant tends to be very unique. Um, everything from the nameplate size, what the ownership structure is about, what the ownership uh, community wants to do with it, or the ownership wants to do with the plant in the future. We see cases where shared ownership, some of the members just want to get rid of the plant as quick as they can. Others see it as a valuable asset they would like to continue with. That could make uh, transitions from coal to nuclear very difficult. Um, the regulation is different, going from the NRC to the, from the EPA to the NRC. What community is it based in? How receptive are they to nuclear? Um, they had this sort of discussion about where could you long-term store waste? How was the community brought into that? How was that done politically? What environment was it in? All those factors um, have a great importance on being successful going to nuclear. Um, the plant details, how big it was, how much cooling water it has, how much life is left into it. What's the environmental condition at the plant? Um, were there toxic spills? What's the ash like? Um, what's the grid connection like? How well was the plant maintained? Lots of those individual details are very important to whether this would be successful, whether a power company in a community would want to go forward. A really interesting one that pops up in the study is what's the real estate value for a coal plant? In some communities, they used to be built on the outskirts of, of a large city. That city has since grown all the way around plants, making their real estate value so high that it could overcome the value of the grid and the heat sink and the desire for stable power. So it's kind of an interesting cutoff. And any one of these issues that gets particularly um, undesirable could very well kill a plant. We see that it takes a strong initiative and a long time and a constant effort to achieve success in this field. Um, reference to plants down in Georgia that are being built now. Um, so how to evaluate this? Working for a national laboratory, we want to evaluate that. We want to evaluate this. We want to help um, produce good methods for doing evaluations and help communities get evaluations. Um, so I'm working with, it's the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear which is a DOE uh, activity um, run out of the Idaho National Laboratory where we try to enable nuclear technology to reach uh, commercialization and the public. And so this is a little bit different bent in that we're looking to help communities, companies um, understand the nuclear transition and whether a coal plant would be um, a good choice for that. And if you imagine, we would like to do this on a number of different plants and effectively create a quilt of examples um, a plant from, say, Wyoming, where they've already made a decision to install one um, through TerraPower. We're looking at areas like the Four Corners in Arizona, Kentucky and the Appalachians. Um, different locations that would have different properties, different regulators, different economics. And we'd like to create the methods and results that allow people to understand better what's needed for a successful coal to nuclear power plant transition. And 
uh, we're ongoing with that development, uh, looking for partners to do that with, um, and looking to have meetings to really get some good input on that. Um, I think this is a very exciting time. I think you can sense that from the previous presenters. Nuclear's uh, very different than it was 10 years ago. Lots of vendors, lots of eagerness. An opportunity exists to really create new things. Hydrogen production, ammonia, um, clean steel, drying techniques, all sorts of applications that modern reactors are allowing that didn't exist before. And this all plays into this decision on can we take advantage of the coal plant that exists and turn it into something of even more value to a community going forward. And I think I was very, uh, very happy to present here because I think the most important thing is to um, start planning, start having a discussion about this. What, uh, what are the plant, plant technical conditions that would allow you to go forward, engage with the community, start the discussion on what the community wants and should be in the future, and then work to make sure the environment is, uh, fee uh, is suitable for creating the conditions we're after. So again, very excited, um, very glad to see you guys are having these discussions. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Griffin. Are there any questions of Mr. Griffin uh, on, uh, on what he said? Uh, Mr. Griffin, is it fair to say that uh, converting a coal plant to a, uh, a nuclear plant is, is, is possible, but there's a lot of questions? Uh, perhaps even Chairman. desirable given the, you know, the transmission distribution out of the plant? Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Yes, I think a coal plant is a, um, it would be a stretch to say an invaluable resource, but I think that grid connection and the community benefits make replacing a coal plant with a nuclear plant particularly attractive. Um, being able to keep the grid stable, being able to have that dispatchable power to work with renewables is a great advantage. Being able to keep high value jobs in the community is good. I think the question sort of is how much of that coal plant converts? I suspect that there's not a lot that converts, at least in a typical case. And you can kind of see that in the recent um, acquisition of coal plants. They had a case um, in the last fall where a nuclear power or a coal plant sold for a dollar and the grid connection sold for $270 million. There's sort of a, how much is the coal plant worth at this point if nobody wants it? Um, so there's, complexities there in any number of levels. Good, thank you. Questions? I see none. Uh, Mr. Griffin, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, your testimony. Uh, very, very helpful and uh, extremely interesting, I thought. So bear with us if you want. If you need to check off, that's fine too. So, thank you very much. So you, moving on then to the state of advanced reactors, we have uh, Mr. Mark Nickel. Uh, from the uh, Nuclear Energy Institute. Mr. Nickel, there you are. Please introduce yourself, thank you, and uh, proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mark Nickel from the Nuclear Energy uh, Institute, and um, in my role, I'm the Senior Director of New Reactors. Uh, we lead the industry efforts to deploy advanced reactors uh, in the policy, regulatory, and market uh, perspective. The Nuclear Energy Institute is a member organization. We have about 300 companies uh, from 17 countries that are members. Those include nuclear operators. Uh, they include nuclear technology developers and supply chain partners. So I'll share my slides here and uh, we'll go through them. <clears throat> I want to start with a picture of what is, what is the deployment uh, plans that we have today. Uh, and they're growing rapidly. Uh, it's more than just a, a couple of demonstrations. Uh, we have more than 20 projects being planned or under serious consideration in the U.S. and Canada. And if you include uh, international, it's more than 30 of the U.S. technologies. The blue dots here, they represent the locations of, of the projects. Uh, the green areas represent states that have uh, policies on the books that are highly supportive of advanced reactors. I'll cover state policies in a later slide. Uh, but this gives you a sense of, of the locations um, and, and, and the, the different plants uh, as well. I would mention that uh, one of these uh, dots in Idaho 
is the UAMPS project. They're a municipal um, utility, and they're deploying the new scale uh, SMR reactor. And just some, some connection back to your home st state of Minnesota, uh, XL Energy is uh, in negotiations with them to be the operator of, of that plant. They would not be an owner, but they would be an operator of, of that, that plant. Uh, moving on to, to the next slide, I want to cover uh, quite a bit of information on, on cost because we get that question a lot. The, the first perspective and most important perspective on, on the question of cost is not how much does this particular reactor cost, it's how much, the, how much is it going to cost the ratepayer and when, when you ask how much is it going to cost the, the average individual, uh, it's a matter of looking at the total system cost. And so this graph is a study that was done in, in Washington State. They have a 100% uh, zero carbon uh, goal uh, state policy. And the utilities started to ask themselves, well, how are we going to get there? And so this study looked at, well, a bunch of different options. And this blue line is if you did renewables and storage alone, uh, you would have a tremendous increase in the cost uh, to those customers. And this is $8 billion uh, increased cost to the customers. That's not total over the lifetime, that's per year. $8 billion a year is the increase in the collective um, uh, rate, the electricity cost that, that the, the rate payers pay. Um, now they said, well, what if we add in SMRs? And you can see down here, that's actually the lowest cost system is if you add in a lot of SMRs, and they actually use um, a very conservative and high cost of, of SMRs. I'll show you some data we have in, in a moment. And so it goes to show you, you actually need to look at it from a system level. You can't look at it um, from an individual level, um, although we'll do that. The, the last point I'll make on this slide is that Washington State is a little bit unique. They have a tremendous amount of hydropower and that's why this knee in the curve is what we call it at 95%, it happens at 95%. If you don't have a tremendous amount of, of hydropower, uh, that knee in the curve is gonna happen uh, at much lower uh, carbon reduction uh, values. So we know with, with advanced reactors, we have to design them to be cost competitive in the market. And we've used a lot of uh, advanced technologies uh, that have come into play, not just in the nuclear industry, but across society, like digital equipment, better materials, uh, in, in developing them. But we also recognize that the, the market wants smaller reactors. So as we started to make smaller reactors, and the market wants smaller reactors because it's smaller capital cost, it better fits the demand profile, uh, as we made them smaller, we found out, actually, we can make them uh, simpler and safer at the same time. The reason is, uh, uh, Mr. White talked earlier about the inherent safety, is that you can rely on, nat on gravity, natural circulation, and by that, you can remove a lot of equipment uh, that you just don't, don't need. Um, so so that, that's, that's uh, an area. And then you can factory build them, you can build them faster, those all go to reducing the cost. So this is a picture of uh, the costs of, of SMRs here on the very far left. And we call this nth of a kind, it's after you build a few and, and you reduce the cost because you've done it over and over and gotten better at it. That, that nth of a kind happens about the fourth or sixth plant and, uh, and, and it's comparing against other costs. Now, this is a modified uh, cost. Most people look at levelized cost of electricity, which is sort of what a, a customer might pay. And we have a slide in the appendix that, that shows that. But what we realize is that it's not just about the levelized cost of electricity. Uh, it has to be dependable. It has to be reliable. It has to be there when you want it. And so there is a, there is a cost to making your power reliable. And this, this report from SMR Start used an ERCOT method for determining the cost of, of reliable power. And here um, we, we, we compare that. And, and that, that ERCOT method basically takes the peak winter and peak summer demands 
and uh, determines the, the load and stress. It's sort of like a, a stress test for energy. And uh, then you come up with the cost of being able to co uh, cover that stress test. And you can see here, SMRs do very well um, in, in comparison to other technologies. On a straight levelized cost of electricity, which is a different slide in the appendix, uh, it's still cost competitive. It's, it's in the ballpark with, with other technologies. So we think cost-wise it does well. The, uh, the, the government, uh, federal government, has a lot of uh, support for advanced reactors. So the first reactors are going to cost more uh, than that nth of a kind value I just showed you. And the government has policy tools to help cover first of a kind costs for new technologies to help them get into the market. And uh, they've done the same thing for renewables. And so these are the, the similar type of, of policies for advanced reactors. Uh, those would be uh, funding demonstrations, tax credits, loan guarantees. Uh, now, Im important across the board is that the, the, the carbon-free value of nuclear is uh, valued equal to, to other sources. Um, and that, that was uh, something that has been changing as many states change from renewable uh, uh, portfolio standards to clean energy portfolio standards. And we recognize state programs have an uh, a, a role to play here. Some states are moving into tax incentives. Others are, are looking at helping to reduce the financial impact to customers by providing advanced cost recovery. And then there's infrastructure support like uh, training and, and other things as, as well. So with that, I, this last slide just shows that uh, your consideration of these nuclear advanced nuclear bills in Minnesota uh, are not alone. You, you are in uh, company with a large number of states that are moving toward uh, passage of bills that support advanced reactors. Uh, this, these, are, these are states that would have been green in the previous, uh, the first slide I showed. And they take many different flavors. There are some that are passing study bills, uh, like, like you're considering here, Montana, is, is an example of that. Um, there are others that are pass, repealing moratoriums on uh, new nuclear. West Virginia did that earlier this year, uh, and Montana did a similar thing uh, last year. And then there are bills that are out there uh, that have been passed that provide tax incentives and other financial uh, support for advanced reactors that would be on par with what states do for renewables and, and other sort clean energy sources. Um, and so uh, Idaho is, is an example of that. And I, I won't go through all the in, in, uh, utility action that, that's taking place here, but the key point to, to say is that in states where we see uh, uh, legislation being passed that supports advanced reactors, we see utility action uh, also occurring to uh, pursue or at least study uh, the feasibility of, of, of advanced reactors in their state. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Any questions? I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Nickel, I'm sorry. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, uh, I sense none right now. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony and your information. Thank uh, you. Again, uh, uh, very much appreciated. Thank and, you. And uh, so lastly, we'll move on to nuclear innovation and opportunities. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Carolyn uh, Cochran, uh, are you with us, uh, Ms. Cochran? Ms. Cochran, are you with us? I am. Sorry. Oh, there yes. you are. Sorry. Give me just a second. Um, sorry about the no. slow to unmute. Um, thank you for allowing me to join remotely today. Um, I do have a presentation. I don't know if you want me to share a screen or just sure. start sharing. Sure, if you okay. Would. Great. Yeah, please introduce yourself for the record. Okay. Yeah, my name is uh, Caroline Cochran. I um, am the co-founder of Oklo Inc. Um, we are a company developing um, small powerhouses. Um, so I will um, pull up that presentation in just a moment. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. I'm trying to get full screen here. Okay. 
sorry, I totally forgot how to make this work. Um, maybe I'll just present it like this. Um, no, that's fine. Holidays. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. All right. Um, so we're really pleased to be here today. Um, a little bit about OPLO. Um, we're developing advanced vision powerhouses that have inherent safety. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the following slide. Um, don't require water either to stay cool or for any other real functional reason. Um, can be flexibly sited and can recycle nuclear waste to produce power. Um, we signed a MOU with the U.S. Department of Energy in 2017. We received a site use permit from DOE in 2019. We were also awarded fuel material from DOE in 2019 and awarded three major projects on fuel recycling from DOE actually this year. Um, so that's just a, a little bit about what we do, but also I, I listed some of those projects to show that the, the U.S. government is, it, you know, through different administrations, is really supporting the development of, of new nuclear power um, plants, and that this can look, you know, many different ways. And so we're really excited about the, the potential for all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Um, our early powerhouses, what we're developing, is actually the footprint of about the size of a large house. Um, so you need less than an acre of actual footprint. Um, there's no water required for safety or for power. And I know I mentioned before, but there's inherent safety characteristics. We really built it off of uh, a legacy of operation um, for actually 30 years out in Idaho. There's um, re research reactors and they, they proved some really incredible safety. In fact, um, some of those safety tests happened the same year as Chernobyl. Uh, um, and, and the news of them really basically got um, drowned in, in, in that catastrophe. But um, it's, it's really incredible to see you know, plants that literally they took the plant at full power, shut off all the cooling, um, the flow of cooling, and they locked the shutdown rods out. And the shutdown rods are what shut down the, the power plant. And um, wait to see what would happen because that's what they do with research reactors. And um, it shut itself down. And to really simplify, how that occurs is because we use metallic fuel, the metal actually expands and the expansion is enough to shut down the reaction. Well, the chain reaction is just too expanded to continue. Um, and so it, it has a natural ability to shut itself down. And that's really the essence of the safety that we're trying to build upon in our powerhouses. Um, Oakland specifically as a company offers vision as a service. So maybe one of, of many different business models, but in other words, New nuclear doesn't have to only look like, um, you know, a big utility buys a design and has to pass off the cost of construction and operation to its rate payers um, for at least our company offers um, vision as a service. And so the idea is, is we can sign PPAs in a model that looks very similar to what renewables do um, currently today. And that's a very um, appealing model for um, many different customers, including utilities themselves, <clears throat> but also industrial users. <clears throat> Apologies. Um, so a little bit about our deployment timeline. I think I share this about Oakland specifically, but again, I realize many of um, the people watching or being interested in this space of new nuclear um, might be excited to hear that um, it's not just really far away. Um, <clears throat> we've been developing this for a number of years now, um, but um, you can actually license plants um, in under three years. And that's actually pretty fast in the span of, of trying to add clean power generation to anything um, and can start some some limited construction during that time. And because the plant's so small, uh, the actual time for construction after that licensing time period uh, can be relatively short. And we're anticipating after, you know, definitely nth of a kind, um, getting those down to a matter of months. Um, so being able to add power um, and load falling power to a grid can happen quickly, even with nuclear power plants. Um, and so this is just yet another slide where I'm illustrating about what OPLO is doing, but also the potential for new nuclear can look much more like this. Um, we don't have to wait a decade or more or spend billions of dollars in order to see these things get deployed in places like Minnesota. And actually, <laughs> I forgot to say this in my intro, but um, my mother's full side of family is from Minnesota. I still have extended family there, so I'm excited to be speaking with you all uh, today in, in general, but also because of that reason. Um, one of the really exciting things and what really got me excited about just being in this space of nuclear when I, I decided to go to grad school at MIT and I was just like really interested in nuclear. I really hadn't heard about it before basically my undergraduate years. Um, 
was learning about the incredible energy density there and really why that can unlock a lot of affordability as well as, of course, it being emission free. Um, so nuclear has the lowest needs for raw materials out there. And um, uh, it's, it's, it, here's uh, an illustration of that. And, and this is just accounting for either fuel, concrete, steel, glass, et cetera. Um, and you can see that um, even if you zoom in, you know, fossil fuels certainly um, take, take the, um, the scale is basically all of that. And if you look at the appropriate scale here, but even zooming in, uh, even comparison to renewables, the amount of materials required for nuclear is just so low. And um, we say advanced fission here, but that can be even lower if you can implement recycling, and that's something I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, because your uh, light, basically, it's so energy dense, uh, your lifetime's worth of emission free power production could fit in an amount of fuel the size of a, a pop can or about, we say, the palm of your hand. Um, in our plants, we have a design that only needs to refuel once every uh, 20 years. Um, it can actually even be longer than that, so we say uh, decades. Um, and it has, nuclear has incredibly high uptime, so you can have almost 24-7 power, it's close to 97 or, or, or even higher um, uptimes, for even for existing plants, let alone new, new nuclear is designed for that as well. The capability to load fall is incredible, um, and so it's uh, operations-wise, um, it's, it's a really interesting and resilient um, grid companion when you can load follow, but also um, just need to refuel once in, in decades. Um, it means clean power for a long time without having to be worried about, oh, you know, fuel prices are really high um, if it only happens once every 20 years, and especially once you're recycling that, then you can recycle again for a number of more years. Um, so that's what we're working towards at Oklo. Um, so yeah, I'll just move on to the next slide. So recycling waste is, is a big part of our goal. Um, both our own used fuel, so I mentioned before we can take a power plant, fuel it, and it can run for, um, let's say, 20 years, but even longer on a single fuel load. We can actually take that fuel, melt it down, take out some of the um, shorter-lived fission products, and then add some fresh fuel to it, recast it, and actually reuse that fuel. And we can actually do that melt-recast method uh, for a number of additional deployments, probably out to 80 years, um, possibly further, but at least um, four different deployments is what we've looked at. But we're also really excited about not just recycling our own fuel, but recycling existing light water reactor, existing conventional nuclear waste, um, what people typically call nuclear waste, which is the used fuel um, from existing plants. And a lot of people within the nuclear industry would say, well, we shouldn't call it waste because it's still so useful. There's so much energy left. Um, only a few percent of the energy in that fuel is actually used. And so we need to call it used fuel or lightly used fuel, whatever you want to term it. Uh, the, the truth is most, most of the public knows it is nuclear waste. And the other truth is there's a lot of energy left in it. And so we're really excited to work with the Department of Energy on ultimately um, taking use of that, making clean power, and turning it into a short-lived um, waste product that no longer has to be um, stored for millennia or so. Um, it's really only um, much shorter lifetimes as well as much shorter inventory, much smaller inventories. So that's, that's most of my slides. I was told to not speak too long, just to show a couple of slides, but hopefully that hits on some of the promise of, of new nuclear um, and with Oklo as, as kind of a specific example of that. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Cochran. Uh, uh, interesting presentation for sure. Uh, I'm sure we're all going to want to know a little bit more about this waste. Is, is that uh, has that been practically implemented, or is that theory at this point? Yeah, it's it's uh, so both the recycling of fuel, of what we're planning to do with our own fuel, has been implemented. So that research reactor I mentioned in, in Idaho, um, it actually produced power for the grid and demonstrated recycling of its own fuel. So we're building off of that process um, for even our our very first core. Our very first plant is actually slated to use fuel from that recycled into our plant. So very first of a kind, we'll be doing that, but it's already been done before. Both for, yeah, again, recycling advanced reactor fuel, but also um, recycling LWR fuel has been done on a pilot scale, and we're looking to, to scale that up. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, you talked about, you know, one of these facilities could 
run for 10, 20 years, what type of an output are you looking at, uh, whether it's for electric generation or heat, but what, what is the output that you're getting from one of those um, mm -hmm. sites? Mr. Cochran? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we are developing powerhouses that are called micro reactors, um, utilize micro reactors, and that it would be less than um, 20 megawatts electric. Um, so typically, uh, if you're familiar with that size range, we'll, we'll say usually on the order, of, a megawatt might be on the order of 1,000 homes, so 20 can be on the order of 20,000 homes, something like that. Uh, thank you. And so then would you envision that you would be able to put multiple of these, say, in one site to uh, stack them together um, if that was desirable in, say, a location where you retired a different source of energy? Yeah, that's certainly something we've been looking at. Um, and we just, we're really starting with that micro reactor size because we see a need for it. But what we're ultimately looking at is developing plants of, of a range of sizes. So if there's desire for much larger plants, um, you know, then that would be a different question, but certainly we're looking at the possibility for having multiple in an area to yep. kind of add to it, yeah, stack it up, like you said. Uh, Senator Eric, anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Cochran. Uh, thank you. A very, very interesting presentation. Uh, they all work, Appreciate and uh, I think we all know a little bit more about uh, the new world of nuclear power uh, today and uh, after Tuesday. So thank you so much. Let's uh, proceed, uh, members, to the uh, Committee of Agenda. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, order of business here is Senate File 2020, or pardon me, two th uh, tw Senate File 225. Uh, it's a Kiffmeyer bill. It's a bill that we heard uh, last, uh, last year, uh, and uh, we bring back for possible inclusion. Uh, You're going to take it to the floor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's a bill that we're, we want to take to the floor, so we'll, we'll have to vote on this particular bill, uh, members. Uh, any discussion on it? At this point, uh, discussion center? This is under Rule 47, by the way. Yes, Senator? Senator? Yes. Mr. Chair, Senator I'm afraid. Prince. Can you, can you uh, say again what the, the procedural stance is here with the bill? Sorry, again? Can you say again, Mr. Chair, what the procedural posture is of the bill? You want to send it to the floor here without further testimony or presentation? Yeah, under under Rule 47, and can counsel or someone clarify that for us? Just goes right. We took testimony on it last year, so it's just a procedural motion to send it back to the floor. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, um, Senator Friend. Yeah, I would like to say a couple things. First of all, it's outstanding presentations today. We're talking about not where we've been with nuclear, but where we're going. I thought the testifiers in particular did a very good job talking about um, advances in safety. I think that's one of the two main concerns that the public has. Um, I also noticed that there was a lot more support in the written materials uh, for lifting the moratorium than there was opposition, although we I'll get opposition on our phones, but I don't really count that if you didn't put it together. I would say on the issue of waste, though, um, I'm going to remain a no on lifting the moratorium, and here's why. I think uh, the issue of waste is unresolved, and I think we need a federal solution to it, and I don't know if we're ever going to get one, or at least not in my lifetime. But I would note, uh, for the record, Mr. Chair, that just as one example, we have the Prairie Island community with this waste being stored about 700 yards away. And I would ask this question of all the advocates here, if the waste is not an issue, how much would we have to pay another community, say North Mankato or Becker, to take that waste out of where it's currently stored and move it there? I don't have an answer in dollar terms, but at some point you'd find a community who would say, okay, we'll do it. And I haven't talked to the administration of North Mankato, but I would imagine many of the residents would say they oppose it. And I think that's our job here to ask questions about what is the answer on waste and I would encourage all of us to, you know, sort of consider that the, the reason the communities don't want it there is they have a legitimate concern about what are the impact of the storage of the waste. And for that reason, um, I'll be a no vote on sending it to the floor, but I look forward to future discussions. And I remain convinced that if our number one environmental goal is to decarbonize, <coughs> wherever you had nuclear, you had to raise it because it's a carbon-free source. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator French. Uh, Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, to some of those points, I would again say 
and as we heard in our uh, hearing uh, on Tuesday, um, the storage piece and what we do with this uh, slightly used fuel, um, we haven't heard any stories of catastrophes in this country at all. And the one testifier we had that showed the pictures um, where they stood right next to the casks um, where they're being stored. Um, these are incredibly safe. They talked about you could crash a plane into that storage facility, nothing would happen. Over 100 years it can be stored there. Um, it, I believe it was uh, the case brought up in Amsterdam where ultimately this is about education. Um, they have created that museum um, where they bring school kids in to see the storage and they walk right past uh, the slightly used fuel that's being stored there. Um, this is, when you look at the facts, um, we do not have an issue. Would it be great if we had one central place like a Yucca Mountain to send this? Absolutely. Um, but we have a, an answer. We are utilizing it right now. And the fact that it's here, I think these new technologies um, are going to be able to re reutilize that same fuel and then having it there on site um, and we'll probably be able to process them, repurpose them, and use them right there. So, um, and this bill, um, if not passed, doesn't even allow us to consider and talk about these options in this state yet. That's why this bill is so critical, and we absolutely need to pass it. Thank you, Senator Rarick. Anybody else? Senator, Senator Brents? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Rarick. I, I think what I hear you saying is you're persuaded that it's safer, and I'm glad to hear that. I think the safer it is, the better it is for Minnesota. What I'm asking is, if that's true, won't we have an easier time finding a place to store it? And I, I'm just suggesting that we want to show the public that it's safe, and the measure will be communities that say, okay, we'll take it here. Um, I'd also say to the point about whether it can or cannot be considered, we've heard this argument. Um, I think the hearing we just had shows that this committee is able to take testimony on nuclear, advanced nuclear in its future. So I do think we're considering it. And we're also watching Senator Matthews and I were looking at the map of the states that have tried it. We'll get the benefit of how their experience is. We'll get to see where the advances are. And I look forward to that. So I do think we're having a conversation about it. And I just want to add, Mr. Chair, that uh, the jobs part of this is a major plus. You know, we want to have people, uh, working men and women in Minnesota, be able to work at these, and I'm interested in that. Um, so that tells you that I think the waste question is a fairly important one, and I'm just saying, let's solve that. Let's Maybe it's a federal repository somewhere. Once we have that, I think the dominoes will start to fall to lift the moratorium. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. Anyone else on this uh, topic? Senator uh, Newman. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, I, you know, I want to follow up on Senator Rarick's comments. The accidents that have happened with uh, nuclear power have happened at the plants themselves. If we've had no accidents uh, anywhere that I know of, and, and with my military background and dealing with nuclear weapons, we've never had accidents with the storage. It's been the plants themselves, Fukushima and Ukraine. Uh, and I, I, I actually support this bill because I don't believe we should be muzzling any attempt to examine new opportunities. And we're hearing that you know, th this is a changing uh, uh, situation. It's not what it was 50 years ago when we first started having uh, nuclear power. So uh, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Torres Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I um, agree with Senator Friends, and I think one of the issues that became very clear to me during these presentations is that the experts that were invited to present did not have an answer uh, for nuclear waste. It was, it was clearly, um, they, they, they said to us, uh, it's your decision, it's a political decision. And, and I think that, that became very clear to me, and, and I think that we are invited to take a, you know, a, a vote on an issue that we can, we can certainly continue to have these conversations. I mean, we just had two days of presentations. Uh, nothing uh, impedes this process. We, we just, you just brought people who are experts and they presented to us uh, the, you know, their knowledge, their understanding, their research. So I, 
I am not clear as to what is this um, actual bill supposed to do. What, what, what is stopping us from continuing this conversation and bringing expertise and making these decisions? I think ultimately is the decision about what to do with uh, nuclear waste, that we just don't have an answer for that. And the decision is going to have to be made by you. you the people who vote for this bill, who, who really want to proceed without that information, without clear understanding of what are we going to do, are going to proceed. But the science, the people that you brought today to give us guidance, did not provide an answer. I, I do not believe that there was an answer in those presentations. Thank you, Senator. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Senator Matthews? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wasn't going to speak because I've got a couple bills to come up, but I'll briefly mention just a uh, couple of points here. Uh, the discussions we did have with the waste, and I think to answer some of these questions, I think if we're concerned about the waste, we should repeal the nuclear moratorium because I think some technologies that are locked away from us in the future on the other side of this moratorium are proposals to try to deal with the waste, to try to reuse it, to try to repurpose it, uh, to burn it down even more. It'll be a smaller amount of waste. Uh, I think the testimony that was mentioned uh, with Yucca Mountain and a political decision, obviously that's not our decision here at this table. We're not the federal government. That's a federal uh, issue uh, that needs to be decided. And I think that as nuclear likely sees a resurgence, I think it's going to have to get back on the federal government's radar uh, to do something about it. And I think some of the answers can be uh, achieved uh, with the waste uh, by repealing the moratorium. And secondly, I'll say again, the nuclear moratorium is not prohibiting committee debate over nuclear bills. The nuclear moratorium is pro prohibiting companies, utility companies or other companies from having a plan that includes nuclear energy. And so it's never been an issue that, well, we don't want to, uh, it's never been a problem that we can't have a nuclear hearing in the Senate Energy Committee. It's that companies, members that are sitting out in our audience or people at home are not allowed to work on or bring a proposal to the Public Utilities Commission or to the relevant authorities here in Minnesota to even start the discussion about having some other site for nuclear energy here in Minnesota. And we are seeing the map. They're going to states all over the country. They're not coming here to Minnesota because they can't. They're not allowed to by law. And they won't be able to until we repeal the moratorium. So that's why I support the bill. OK, any further discussion? If not, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, all in favor, then, of moving uh, Senate file 225 to the floor, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. And uh, no. the uh, motion is adopted. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator uh, Matthews, do you want to move uh, forward with the uh, Senate file 4082? And I think you have an A1 amendment. You want to move that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there's an A1 author's amendment. Okay, we've got an A1 author's amendment. Uh, it uh, looks uh, fairly technical, at least. It uh, looks like housekeeping. Uh, all yes. in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay, and uh, the amendment's on the bill. Uh, proceed, uh, Senator Matthews, as you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Senate File 482 is what I believe a small step in the way I believe eventually the state of Minnesota does need to fully repeal the nuclear moratorium. But Senate File 4082 is an effort to start by taking a small step in that direction, and it would be to exempt any a uh, nuclear generation generating facility of 100 megawatts or less from the nuclear moratorium so that we could start the conversation, meaning companies could come to Minnesota with proposals that could be presented to the PUC to consider plans for these small or micro-sized nuclear facilities. Could be some of the ones of presentations that we've heard from today 
Uh, I have seen some other presentations made by other companies, and this would be an effort to allow this to be started on a very small scale. And so while we still have some uh, disagreement over the full moratorium, I had this idea earlier this year uh, to say, well, then why don't we have a carve out for things that are small? Uh, we can try them, we can see how they work, we can put them in places uh, where it makes sense. Uh, as we're retiring our coal generation in the state of Minnesota, and we're not, we're not in favor of uh, gas generation as much as I would like, uh, then we're going to need to have more nuclear because we're going to need uh, the base load generation uh, to be uh, dependable and sustainable uh, for us moving forward. So this is my bill, Mr. Chair. It is uh, pretty short and simple. I believe there are several testifiers that want to speak to it. I don't have... Uh, the full list in front of me, uh, but I'd be happy to uh, turn it over uh, to our testifiers, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay, uh, we do have one on the list, and we can call others forward if they want to. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, may I uh, yes. say something? Uh, Senator. We just passed um, or moved to uh, Senate File 225, and lines 1 through 1.7, 1.9 in your bill, uh, Senator Matthews, uh, has that same, um, <laughs> uh, it has the information in there that we just deleted. Uh, so I, does this have to be further amended to uh, reflect that? Uh, Senator Newton, this doesn't lift the full moratorium. It, it, it creates a, a carve out, but I'll, I'll refer to the uh, Senate Council so you get the, the legal answer. Yes, Mr. Chair um, and members and Senator Newton. So this is a, a complete, that would be its own bill to, get rid of the uh, moratorium altogether for nuclear uh, plants. This bill would, like Senator Senjum mentioned, would be a carve out to just allow, that the prohibition would not apply for a, um, for these small scale nuclear, uh, their reactors okay. that are under 100 um, megawatts or less of energy. Okay. Thank so, you, thank yep. you very uh -huh. much for the clarification. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so to the witness, uh, Mr. Tuma. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Matthews, thank you. Uh, I think uh, my name is John Toom. I'm a Public Utilities Commissioner. I was here before uh, in front of you, and I appreciated the time I had in front of you before. And I promise you that uh, I'll try not to be back here again. I think I've testified five times in the legislature in my seven years in the commission, so uh, I'll try not to bug you, bug you down the road, but I did promise Senator Matthews to talk about this legislation. I think from the perspective of someone who does the planning for you uh, around uh, um, resources in Minnesota. And so I want to indicate, of course, the disclaimer today, I'm testifying on my own behalf and not on behalf of the PUC. Uh, the commission has not had an open meeting on this, taken any position on it, so uh, I can only speak for myself. Uh, so my testimony today uh, does not reflect the views of the commission or the, any of my fellow commissioners. Um, I would like to start out, though, and, and indicate Senator France, that uh, I agree with you, no real discussion, a real serious discussion uh, about nuclear uh, um, kind of moratorium or, or considering nuclear moratorium uh, can be had without really putting in appropriate context, historical context, uh, regarding the temporary storage uh, that was allowed at uh, our nuclear sites several years ago. It was uh, Richard Wilson uh, uh, Riley, who was the governor of South Carolina in 1982, had this little nugget of southern wisdom. He said, there is one basic law of nuclear waste often overlooked. All waste remains where it was first put. And uh, that happened to find its way into Minnesota history in 1992 uh, when we had uh, the very contentious, uh, uh, probably the last real contentious thing until something recently uh, in front of the PUC, which was regarding the storage of nuclear waste at Prairie Island. And that uh, was three dec ago, decades ago. Uh, Governor O'Reilly said that four decades ago. Uh, we at the commission uh, recognize that that's sadly almost becoming prophetic. But we've been working very, very hard uh, on behalf of the state of Minnesota in cooperation with the affected communities and in cooperation with Excel to try to find solutions, permanent solutions for that uh, temporary storage. Uh, I believe there is a consensus in Minnesota 
that our number one priority, regardless of what we do with a carve out or, or a, ref, a referendum to undo the moratorium, is to find something to do with that waste permanently. I think if you would ask Minnesotans that question, I think there's a, a clear consensus. And we've been working very hard at the commission to hopefully prove Governor Riley uh, wrong. Uh, but it's been a challenge. Even though with small reactors included in this legislation, nuclear, nuclear waste will continue to be an issue uh, that is not resolved. And the dilemma is far more complex than represented, I think, in the Tuesday hearing that I watched. Uh, and I appreciate it. It was a very good hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman. But it is a complex issue. It's, uh, uh, and I want to indicate by my testimony uh, on this bill today, I am not signaling any position that I would take if this were to be passed, uh, and whether I would support any of the technology or the individuals who support technology that's under here. I just wanted to give you the perspective of where we are at. And I think there is some wisdom in creating a limited carve out uh, to uh, this particular moratorium, simply to distinguish itself first from the second generation of nuclear facilities, those we have here in Minnesota. Uh, they have long since passed their useful life. And I think, therefore, it's wise to recognize that the decision we made three decades ago was a smart decision in the legislature. Some of us were here. I, was, I just came the year after the legislature made that tough decision um, and to do the moratorium. It was a wise decision then. Uh, so I think it's OK, though, that we allow utilities and the commission to, at a minimum, consider some of these new technologies that didn't exist three decades ago. Uh, Baseload power generation facilities that will be the most desirable in the future in the Midwest uh, and probably in the foreseeable horizon that we can tell as we transition are those that are able to follow load and to partner with the variable renewable energy that's becoming the backbone of our system. It's becoming the backbone because it's cheap and we figured out how to use it. And we do need something that marries with it quite well. Um, if uh, we are truly serious about deep carbon reduction, the promise, and I emphasize, it is the promise by people who are promoting their particular energy uh, program or energy reactor, but it still is a promise that they have out there that these facilities could effectively fit within the mix we're creating here in the Midwest through MISO and through our policies here in the state of Minnesota. I think Dr. Finan uh, yesterday in her testimony, or on Tuesday in her testimony, I thought it was very, very good. I think she was very honest and she indicated from what I heard that these next generation of nuclear facilities are not the answer. They are an answer uh, within a broader issue that we're working on. And I think that we need to put it in that perspective. I think a lot of people oversell the nuclear power situation because of what's going on. Um, they are a reasonable solution, possibly, in the mix that we're developing. Any facility that comes before the commission, I can assure you, will be carefully considered against all the other emerging technologies that are out there including things like hydrogen, carbon capture, hydro, large-scale batteries, and frankly, stuff that we don't even know that's on the drawing board today that we're going to be facing. But we are facing it. Uh, there is change going on. There is a transition happening in our energy system. It is going to be built on a very strong foundation of renewables. And this mix that will produce a clean, reliable, and affordable energy source needs to have good partners it's worth at least considering uh, these nuclear facilities as we go forward. I appreciate Senator Matthews uh, taking a lead on this uh, because this is a serious issue. And I know him as a serious person. I've known him for a long time. I won't tell you how long I've known him because it'll tell you how old I am. <laughs> but uh, this is an issue that requires bringing in lots of different interests, people affected communities and um, lots of discussion about what is that a reasonable mix that we can have and is there a place in Minnesota for this. I can assure you that the Commission will continue and I will continue to work hard to find a solution to permanent, the permanent waste storage issue um, and hopefully prove Governor Riley wrong uh, in the long run. 
But in the short run, uh, that's an issue that needs to be addressed and be understood, and I think you need to bring a lot of people to the table. But I look at it as a commissioner who is seeing the changing going on and the decisions that we're going to be making in the next couple of decades. Having as many of these opportunities, these different sets of mixes, is going to be the key. I think Dr. Finan was right. It's going to require a lot of different types of things working together wisely, and we're going to have to consider a lot. And this is not one we can't consider. I assure you, I will be very, very tough on anything that would come before me uh, with regards to nuclear, and I'm going to want to listen to uh, the affected communities um, as we deal with it. Um, but I think it's okay to consider it, um, and it's your decision. I'm not supporting or against it. I'm your handmaiden, uh, and I will do what you ask me to do, and I will consider the legislation very carefully. But I just wanted to point out, we're already making and thinking about decisions in the next decade or so to make major transition in Minnesota, and this potentially, given the promise from providers uh, of the information you've heard today, could be, uh, could be a useful tool with our renewable backbone that we're building. With that, Mr. Chairman, Good. I'll answer any questions. Of course, I got to be any questions. I got to be pretty careful on what I say, but uh, uh, I appreciate your time and. And hopefully not to have to see you in, in any time soon, but thank you. Senator Eric, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. and uh, Commissioner Tuma, we, we have heard in this debate over and over that uh, we are allowed to talk about nuclear in this state when we have these hearings here. Can the PUC hear anything and discuss and look at options in regards to nuclear energy in Minnesota right now? Well, Senator Tuma, Mr. Chairman, Senator, and, I'm sorry. Uh, don't, don't, don't promote me that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chair, uh, Chair Senjum and, and Senator Rarick, you know, we can consider anything. Uh, the, the moratorium is that no utility can come to us for a certificate of need. I can't give you a certificate of need if you came to me and asked me for a certificate of need for something that would be a nuclear generation facility. That is, I'm prohibited to do that. You have permitted me from doing that. Can we have discussions? Certainly. We could have a planning meeting. We could in invite industry in and have a conversation like you just had. These are not things that we do because why would we do it? We have to focus on the things that we have time to do. And right now, uh, it would be an interesting academic discussion. I, I, I'm interested in this issue uh, personally as just an individual because I think it's critical. I was around this issue when I first ran for office. My good friend Tom Neville, uh, Senator Tom Neville, who sadly passed away here just recently, educated me on this as an engineer, and we both were adamantly opposed to this second generation of nuclear that we have from a very conservative perspective. But that's just a conversation we can just have, me and you. Uh, it doesn't make any sense for the PUC to have it because we have no authority to issue a certificate of, of need. Okay. <laughs> any follow-up? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think that's that. I appreciate that answer. That is exactly what um, I think we were looking for. Um, a discussion can be had, but there is zero point, and no one is going to do it in this state because it cannot be considered in its true legitimate form. So no company is going to waste its time and its efforts going down that road until this moratorium is lifted. Um, and I know, I think most of us uh, in this room, uh, but that when we, when we voted on Senate File 225, that is our preferred uh, path, but this is a great option. Um, if, if this one can get through, if the other one cannot, it gives us that ability to at least uh, have some of these new options on the table for real discussion um, as these new technologies emerge. Um, and I think, I just, I can't help it, but, uh, as we talk about the waste uh, and the potential of that, I sure hope then we start having a discussion what we're going to do with these solar panels um, that have, are full of hazardous material and we have no way to deal with them at this point. That is waste. Every type of energy source that we have has some type of waste and nuclear is actually some of the smallest amount of waste and easiest to manage out there. Um, we have all these windmills as well. What are we going to do with that waste when it comes to end of life? So if that's where we're going to go and we're going to be so concerned, let's have that concern about everything. Thank you.
Uh, Senator French. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we're running late here, so I, I want to start by saying, Senator Rarick, I look forward to the discussion on the waste of all the forms of energy. Um, Senator Matthews, uh, you and I have had discussions about nuclear. Here's a news flash. I'm a yes on this bill. Um, and I would just say, our discussions about nuclear are exactly what should be happening. We seem to disagree how much we're allowed to discuss in Minnesota. I would say companies that can do business and discuss nuclear in another state have an opportunity to make their case. But for today, uh, I kind of thought the study bill would be the compromise, but I'm going to go yes on this bill too, and yes on the study bill. And, uh, you know, let's have the discussion and let's have all voices at the table. I think we'll have the best chance to get it right in Minnesota. And after all, that's what we're looking for, right? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else in the audience wish to testify on this bill? Sensing none. Okay. Uh, if the if there are no other to, uh, comments from the members, uh, then uh, Senate File uh, 4082, as amended, is recommended to uh, go to the floor. And uh, all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 I oppose nay, and uh, it is so done. Okay, moving on then, uh, Senator uh, Matthews, uh, Senate File 4163. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Chair. Uh, this is also a very uh, short bill. It, uh, it uh, appropriates $150,000 to the Department of Commerce to conduct a study uh, into the potential costs, benefits, and impacts of these advanced nuclear technology reactors in Minnesota. Lists out a number of things they should consider, uh, including one that I will highlight here, the feasibility of replacing the coal-fired coal boilers with advanced nuclear reactors while accounting for the avoided costs that result from the closure of coal-fired plants. Uh, as uh, we are uh, bringing these uh, plants to their end of life and in many cases much faster than uh, in their uh, original lifespan intended to be. Uh, this will be for the department to study uh, more in depth. Uh, I think the, some of the information we need to have surrounding uh, one of these new technologies that are uh, near in the future upon us. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I would ask for support for this bill. Uh, members, any questions of the author? Uh, any testimony on the bill from uh, anybody present, uh, virtually or otherwise? Okay, Senate file then, uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll proceed to the vote, Senate file 4063, uh, it uh, does have a finance component to it, so uh, we would uh, move, uh, recommend the approval of the bill and referring to finance. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay, and the bill is uh, adopted and uh, referred then to finance committee. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Senator Matthews, very much. Uh, that concludes the business of the day. Uh, we're only five minutes late. That's not too bad. So <laughs> we will uh, see you next Tuesday.